Room 442 is brought to you by No Star Bets. That's a win. It is nearly time for the Women's World Cup. We are days away from the Women's Champions League final. Chelsea has just won the Women's FA Cup. It is such an exciting time for women's football. And who better to speak with than former Canadian footballer Amy Walsh? And may I also say Canadian Soccer Hall of Famer? Oh, you may. You can say that. (laughs) Thank you so much for joining me. My pleasure. Let's quickly talk some Chelsea football. Chelsea just won, just as in a couple weeks ago now, but won the FA Cup against Manchester United. Kadisha Buchanan and Jesse Fleming have a cup. How exciting is that for Canadian football right now? It's huge. I think it, it shines the light on our Canadian footballers in a way that they don't get often enough. I think they're constantly fighting respect, fighting for respect, not only with their own federation and their own backyards, but for worldwide respect on a team level, but also on an individual level. So I think the more that we see the Buchanans, the Flemings, you know, chatter about maybe Ashley Lawrence making the move from PSG there as well to play for Emma Hayes. Um, We also have Vanessa Gill, um, you know, winning doubles with Lyon. I think the more that you get that, that notoriety and the buzz around Canadian footballers, the better for our program, the better for the future generations. Yeah, I mean, Jade Rivera was also, I mean, she didn't play in this game, but we know she's on Manchester United. Adrian Leon was there, now she's mm-hmm. on loan. But there are so many Canadian footballers that are making their way to Europe. And it sounds bad, but I do think that that's where they get the most recognition. It's still like men's football here when you compare MLS to anywhere in Europe. Over there, it's just like a higher level. But there are so many Canadians overseas now, and not just playing football, but winning yeah and playing meaningful competitive games year round and I think that's the translation that you want to the international stage uh, when we talk about what it means for for our Canadians so we go back to to Chelsea so that's their fourth win in a row for the league Um, I think Jesse Fleming at 24 I think she is I think that's her third um, double she's also got a treble in there as well like it's it's insane the type of success that these players are having at such an early age. Um, And you look at the talent that surrounds her and the talent that she gets to compete with on the training pitch every single day. And then she gets to bring that high competitive level back to the national team. So I think you go back to the She Believes Cup. I'm sort of going um, into left field a bit from your question. And you, you, um, Bev Priestman had to lean on those informed players really heavily. And those informed players didn't perform. So now we get, you know, we're less than 50 days out of the World Cup. Um, You know, how is she going to balance that squad? You have the NWSL players now that are rounding into form. So how do you balance that 23 player roster with players of all these different leagues who are being tested on a daily basis, bring them together and hopefully make them a cohesive unit so that they can finally have success on the World Cup stage because they so desperately need it. And I think they, they deserve it. But it's been a rough go of late for this team in terms of their preparation. Uh, But going back to Chelsea, you look at Fleming. You look at Buchanan, I think you like some rocky beginnings, I think, especially for Buchanan coming from a really successful tenure at Lyon and uh, injuries didn't help. But um, I think struggled a little bit early on with the demands and the rigors of the WSL in terms of how physical it was. And then Fleming, I think, just has a difficult time cracking um, that lineup. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. you look at how important Aaron Cuthbert is in there. You have Sophie Ingle. Um, you know, you have a, a number of different players. Uh, Guru Wrighton, even though she plays a little bit more outside. But it's a tough squad to crack. But I think, again, even if she doesn't fe- uh, feature or figure in that starting 11, it goes back to that competitive level and that really high-quality level that she's playing at every single day. And I think, ultimately, it means that she's going to be a top-class player. Jesse Fleming is one of those players that when you meet and when you speak to her, she's so kind. She's this little petite you know, young female, and then you see her get on the pitch and she's an absolute rocket. And she also has such a important role, not only with Chelsea now, but with Canada being that pivotal piece kind of in the middle, everyone plays off her. She's like you mentioned 24 and really what a star. Yeah, she is. And I, and again, just, just the very beginning of, Mm -hmm. of her career, but accomplished so much. So I think you've seen Bev, lean on Jesse heavily in terms of the leadership 
in terms of the demands put on her um, and the expectations as well. But she's, she's shown uh, time and time again that she's prepared for it. She expects it and in fact demands it of herself. And I think you can see that, that respect that, that the, the players have for her. Um, I, you don't see her in the locker room, but to me, she reminds me of a, of a young Christine Sinclair and the way that she conducts herself, the way that she operates on the pitch, very stoic, leads by example. But this team, in order for it to have success um, at this World Cup, which is, again, right around the corner, this team needs to play through Jesse Fleming. Um, you need to play her higher up the pitch. I've been talking about this for a long time. I know Claire Rust had as, as well. Um, and it depends. And, you know, this, this injury is so riddled um, with, with uh, or the roster is so riddled with injury. So she's going to be put where Bev needs her, where she's required. But for this team to have success, to do well, to be productive offensively, I think that the offense has to run through Jesse Fleming. But now let's jump to the Champions League final. In two days' time on Saturday, Barcelona taking on Wolfsburg. I just want to know, what are your thoughts going into this match? Do you have any predictions? I am a, unfortunately very biased fan when it comes to this particular match, being the Barcelona <laughs> fan I am. But what are your thoughts going into this match? Yeah, I think this one is, is Barca's to lose, quite mm. frankly. I think you see Wolfsburg eliminate Arsenal, um, maybe not super convincingly, but they're a team uh, that's going to sit back, absorb Barca. Barca's going to have the ball for the majority of the time. That's what they want to do. They're going to dictate the game. They're going to try to go through the spine. So if, if, um, if Wolfsburg can control the middle of the park, um, then I think that, you know, going quick in the counterattack, they might be dangerous. Um, and they're a highly physical squad as well. Um, so I think if you, Caroline uh, Graham Hansen, if she gets isolated 1v1 on that right flank, she could prove to be very, very dangerous for, for Barca. So I think it's how the fullbacks um, for Wolfsburg manage um, the way that Barca is set up. So Hansen is up a little bit higher, but they also like to push that, that left back um, quite high up um, in, uh, in Jada's daughter. So it, it, it's about Wolfsburg, how they control Barca's attack defensively, and then can they be effective on the counter and also winning the ball on the counter press um, in dangerous areas of the, of the pitch. But I really do think it's, it's Barca's to lose. And then a wrinkle in there would be um, uh, how does uh, Puteas, the, if she slots in, um, does that maybe knock them off their game a little bit? I mean, obviously, from an individual perspective, you want to have her in your lineup. But does she throw off maybe you know, how, like the synchronicity, um, mm -hmm. how, how well they've mashed, especially in that four-man midfield, because um, they're like the, the off wing usually drops into the middle for that overload in the middle of the park. So again, it goes back to Wolfsburg, how they manage that. Yeah, I mean, I think Barcelona, if you're Barcelona, you have to start with AS just because of not only the talent, but she has so much leadership with this team. that I think that's such a massive factor. But listen, you're right. It's also a final. We never know what's going to happen. It's one game. Anything can happen, but I think it'll be really class football. One thing also I want to ask about this is because I'm really frustrated with this, but this game is actually at the same time as the FA Cup for the men, Manchester yeah. Derby, a massive game. I'll be having two screens on on Saturday, but how frustrating is it that women's football, not only in Canada, but all over the globe, is growing at a really good rate and it's really coming into its own and it's fantastic to watch. But then you see things like this when it's the Champions League final, arguably the biggest game annually for either men or women, and it happens to be at the same time as the FA Cup final for the men. Yeah, it's, um, it, it's, it's frustrating to say the least. Uh, I mean, women's football has continually been an afterthought and there's very little foresight when you think about shining the light on it the way that it deserves. I'm sure that you'd be able to, you know, studies have shown that they're, they're finding viewership in pockets of people who are tuning into the WSL, who are tuning into women's football via DAZN or these other platforms that perhaps aren't tuning into to your Premier League or to your La Ligas. Um, so that's great, but I think there is a crossover, you know, the Venn diagram of, of soccer fans, there is that middle. And I think that women's soccer, if it's going to really grow, you need that visibility, especially for these high quality matchups between, um, you know, two huge um, teams like Barca and, and Wolfsburg. You want to give it the biggest platform possible, but then you get there and then you shoot yourself in the foot because you're, you're sort of, you know, from, from the get go. 
um, you know, you're, you're limiting yourself in terms of your viewership. So it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me that you're, we're making these advancements and yet continually don't have the foresight to give it the platform or the, the visibility that it truly merits and deserves. So hopefully people, you know, when they're planning these things out, or are going to stagger them and obviously not give the women the substandard times and the kickoffs and things like that. But you're able to slot things in so that a, a football fan can enjoy all, all that's to offer and all that's out there in terms of your best football. Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, we also remember what happened with Canada and France and that international friendly happening on the day of a Champions League group stage <laughs> match. Yep. It's one of those things that they just need to prepare for much more in advance in order to have that visibility. But yeah, I completely agree. Let's now look though to Canada and the World Cup because it is creeping in so quickly. A really exciting time for Canadian football. I think because we know that this is going to be the last tournament for Christine St. Clair, but also I think a lot of players were seeing like a shift, especially the American team as well. So many players that we have been watching for so long you know the generation is shifting it could be a good thing it could be a bad thing but mm -hmm. specifically with this canadian team injuries you know all about it i mean there's so many that have been picked up obviously janine becky the big one kadisha buchanan's back in action is she 100 percent undetermined shalina and everything she's going through mm -hmm. obviously desiree scott having surgery at the end of 2022 Bev Friesman has some serious work to do with this roster what are you expecting for canada in this tournament Oh my goodness. Um, Loaded I, I, question. <laughs> yeah, holy, holy moly, Sarah. Yeah. Um, I think expectations will, will remain high despite the substandard preparation, despite their funding being pulled, they still will be expected to perform. Um, and these women, this team doesn't just have the luxury and they have not had the luxury to just simply worry about results. They have to worry and contend with everything that's going on off the field. We saw that at She Believes. Um, so it's about weighing, you know, fighting for a cause, fighting for what you deserve, um, but also using the performances and, and the matchups, meaningful games, meaningful minutes as part of your preparation. So, there's, so they've sort of been hamstrung from the get-go, but I think if this team, they need to make it out of their group, they need to win the group and avoid England. Um, but then if they don't even move beyond, say, the group stage or the round of 16, it will be seen as a failure um, and it will be put on this team. It will not be put on the Federation. Um, so uh, to go back to, to your question about um, all these players with injuries and who will be rounding in, into form, I think the good news is what we let off with, that there's a, a huge or an important core group that is playing at a really high level with club and that will be brought into this camp. Uh, Serena Wiegmann drops the England squad super early. It dropped mm -hmm. yesterday. Um, and then in everything that came out in the press release surrounding it, uh, they were saying that uh, Bev Priestman's, their, I think it was Bayern Munich were talking about, and the WSL teams, slightly angry with Canada because Priestman had requested those players for June 12th, which was very, very early. But I think Pressman, uh, Priestman doesn't have the luxury of just naming her squad because there's so many question marks, so many players working against the clock. So what will that final roster look like? And will Priestman select a Nichelle Prince or a Deanne Rose at 70% fitness over somebody who is fully fit? Maybe a Clarissa uh, Laracy, um, you know, is, is maybe because unlike the men, the men had a roster of 26 the, for the Women's World Cup, FIFA elected to drop back down kind of to the post-COVID or the pre-COVID number of 23. So working against the clock for all these players, what will that roster look like? But they will still be expected to get results. Really hoping them the best, but the pressure is on for Bev Priestman. The Women's World Cup kicks off July 20th. Room 442 is brought to you by North Star Bets. That's a win.